it looks like we're ready to start. So um, we're talking a bit more about chirality today. Uh, last time we talked a bit about what chirality is um, and then how we identify chiral carbons within molecules. This time we're going to be touching on first why chirality is important, um, why we're spending so much time talking about stereochemistry, and how we systematically assign chiral centers within molecules. All right, so as always, we're starting off with our scientist spotlight. Um, I wanted to highlight an undergraduate researcher this lecture. Um, so this is DJ. He is in my lab at Syracuse University, and uh, his research is really a, a good complement to what we're, uh, what we're talking about today, where he develops reactions to create these chiral centers. Um, so you'll see uh, when we talk about the importance that chiral centers are hugely useful, uh, just broadly in, in organic synthesis and in drug development. Um, and so it's a very like prominent area of research uh, to develop these reactions that can efficiently create uh, chiral centers. And then I also wanted to highlight uh, specifically an undergraduate researcher because I think sometimes it can be kind of hard to uh, sort of like see yourself uh, in the scientists that I, I spotlight up here. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we see these these sort of praised and awarded scientists that have been uh, that have been doing research and teaching for twenty or thirty years, right? Uh, but really, the fact of the matter is the the researchers who are really in the trenches doing the experiments and working up the data and making the discoveries, uh, that's you guys, that's undergraduate researchers, that's graduate researchers, that's early career industry chemists. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely don't be intimidated by research. You're never too young to get involved in, uh, in, in research. And it, I really think that research is the best way for you to really develop yourself as a scientist and and uh, understand how science really works, the nature of, of how science operates. So yeah, just uh, briefly before we get into it, um, wanted to review what we were talking about last time, where chirality is this handedness, right? Um, so it's, it's a property where the mirror image of itself, of the object, can't be superimposed over top of itself, which we, we demonstrated that last time when I had you guys uh, use the model kits and create two enantiomers and then try to uh, physically manipulate them without breaking any bonds, and you can't superimpose them. They're fundamentally different objects, right? So that's what chirality is. Uh, we'll talk a bit about why we care, though. Right. So a good example of the importance of chirality is within drug development, uh, where 60 percent of FDA approved drugs uh, right now are their chiral drugs. So we'll take some time to uh, to think about that, why this might be. Um, I'll have you guys break up into the same groups as last time and um, just try and answer these three questions and we'll get some volunteers to try try to see if we can understand why so many drugs are, are chiral, why it's important for drugs to be chiral. So yeah, take a few minutes. It's just what do drugs do, uh, how do drugs work, and what do drugs act on? So three just very broad questions, then we'll get some volunteers. Okay, so do we have any volunteers for let's let's just go in order here. So uh, what do drugs do? Just some examples of, you know, everyone's taken some sort of pharmaceutical at some point in their lives. Uh, what are some some common effects, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so that's definitely common one is uh, drugs will decrease inflammation, right? Um, how about one more example? Yeah. 
That is definitely common. Drugs can they can change the way you think, right? Um, so what does this tell us about drugs? The their the function of drugs um, changes some some physical state within our physiology, right? Uh, so what how does that inform us on how drugs work? Any volunteers there? Yeah. Okay. So exactly. So they they alter our biochemistry in some way, right? That's a, a, a common thing. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Definitely. Okay. So that that really hits it on the head. Uh, drugs work by. Binding receptors, right? That's a big thing. And that really, that informs us on what drugs act on, right? So they bind receptors, they're acting on those receptors. Um, can anyone tell me what are receptors? They're, it's, they're within a certain class of biomacromolecule. Yeah. Okay. So receptors are a type of protein, right? And then what are proteins made of? What are the building blocks of all proteins? Exactly. So proteins are, proteins are made of amino acids, right? And that really answers our question, right? Because you may not uh, know this off the top of your head, but amino acids, 95% of amino acids Ninety-five percent of amino acids are chiral, right? So every single protein that exists is made out of chiral building blocks. So it makes sense that when they fold up and they create this receptor, they create this binding pocket. That that binding pocket is going to have a high degree of chirality when it's made out of chiral building blocks. So if we take a look at at a specific example. Um, so this is a crystal structure of the 5-HT2B receptor with LSD bound within the, uh, the active site. So this is an active area of research to sort of define and characterize the active site of various receptors. And you can see if we zoom in on, uh, on this C portion, right, you can see there's a high level of chirality within this pocket here, right? It's a very irregular shape. Um, and you should also notice that LSD, it binds deep in the pocket and the shape of LSD sort of, it perfectly molds to, uh, to the shape of the interior of that, the binding of the pocket, right? And it's the stereochemistry of LSD that makes it that shape that it can fit in this pocket. So that's really, for, for drug design at least, that's the huge importance of why 60%, over half of pharmaceuticals that are approved right now are chiral, because we need them to be a specific shape so that they can match the specific shape of whatever receptor they're trying to modulate the activity of. So any questions on, uh, on that before we move on? I know it's a little little bit of biochem, but I thought it might be interesting. Okay. So yeah, we've established uh, what chirality is and why it's so important, why we want to spend the time to learn about stereochemistry, right? Um, now we need to figure out how do we assign chirality? How do we, so we know there's these two enantiomers. Uh, how do we distinguish between those two enantiomers? Um, and this isn't, uh, this isn't a, a, a new thing in chemistry. Uh, this is something that we figured out a while ago. Um, so back in 1966, Kahn, Ingold, and Prelog, um, they proposed a three-step systemic method for assigning stereochemistry, um, for uh, assigning chirality, sorry. And that systemic method was adopted by the IUPAC, and that's what the entire chemical world uses today. Um, so what is this method? It is uh, three rules. It's the Conningle-Prelog rules. 
the first rule is you want to prioritize the, the four groups around the chiral center according to the atomic number where the highest priority is going to be the highest atomic number, the lowest priority is going to be the lowest atomic number. Um, so if we look at this tetrahedral carbon up in the corner, um, we have fluorine, nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen. Um, so that's going to coordinate to our first group being fluorine, second nitrogen, third carbon, fourth hydrogen, right? So once you assign the groups, second step is you want to orient the, uh, the chiral center so that the lowest priority substituent is facing away from you. Um, so when you use these, these wedge and dash projections, what that means is the dashed bond is the lowest priority uh, substituent, right? So if you look at our example molecule, we don't have to change anything here. Um, the, our hydrogen, which is our fourth substituent, that's already facing away from us. And then number three is you trace the path from one through three um, and see whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise in direction. So if it's clockwise, then the chiral center is going to be R. If it's counterclockwise, the chiral center will be assigned S. So in our case here, we have one, two, three. That's counterclockwise, right? So this is going to be an S chiral center. So yeah, three steps, um, fairly straightforward. Uh, we'll get right into the practice, right? So uh, this is one of the online top hat problems. So if you have your, uh, your laptop, go ahead and open that up. Um, but I'll have you guys look at uh, molecules one and two and take, take a few minutes to try and assign the following, both of them as uh, R or S. Okay, so let's think about these, right? So uh, first step of the conjugal Prelog rules is, yeah, so first step is we need to assign our substituents. Um, does anyone want to shout out what, uh, what you got here? Yeah, so bromine is gonna be our first substituent. Oxygen is two, carbon is three, hydrogen is four, right? Second step of the uh, the SIP rules, right? Second step is we need our lowest priority to be facing back. We're good here. Um, the hydrogen for both of these is facing away from us. And then third step. Yeah, third step is go ahead and trace one through three. So for molecule number one, we're going this way. Molecule number two, we're going this way. So for one, that's counterclockwise. So what would that be? So this will be an S chiral center. Um, number two is going clockwise, so that's gotta be R, right? All right, any questions on this one? There's a few more that I'll have you guys practice. Okay. Um, so this is also on top hat, a little bit more involved, right? We're bringing in like new concepts with these. Um, so take a few minutes, take a stab at a uh, compound three and four, and see what you get there. Okay, so compound three, uh, we know the first step is to assign our groups, right? So what do we got there? Yep. So fluorine is going to be our number one group. Oxygen is our number two. Carbon is three. Hydrogen is four, right? And then this is what's new about this one, right? So we have our hydrogen is a, uh, a wedge line, not a dash line. So um, what do we have to do? How, how, how did you guys approach this? Yeah, so one way you can do it is Absolutely, you can uh, do like a 90 degree rotation, right? And then so that'll make the, the hydrogen, the dash bond. So if you do that, you've got fluorine, you've got your CH3 here. 
methoxy is now a wedge. Hydrogen is a dash. So that leaves you with uh, one, two, three, four. Then from there, you can go ahead and uh, do your clockwise or counterclockwise. So we've got one, two, three. Um, that's clockwise, right? So that's going to be in our center. Um, so that's one way you can do it, definitely. Um, I would recommend against this. Uh, there's there's another way that you can do this where you don't have to do that mental manipulation where you're sort of rotating the bonds in your head. Um, so for the flip rule, right? Uh, if your priority for substituent isn't attached to a dash line, uh, you can just use the regular SIP rules and then reverse the stereochemistry, right? So let's try that for this. If we go ahead and trace one to three, we've got one, two, three, which normally, since that's counterclockwise, that would indicate an S chiral center. We flip that. It's an R chiral center. So we're getting the same thing either way. Um, if you use the flip rule, you don't have to worry about the, the mental manipulation there. Um, so that's what I would recommend is uh, take advantage of that flip rule. And then uh, number four, uh, does anyone want to share how they how they started for or what uh, how you assigned the, the different groups for four, right? Yeah, this one was tough, right? Because we how we're sitting right now, we don't really have a way to assign the groups because if you look at it, we've got uh, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, oxygen. Right, so we know the uh, hydrogen. This is going to be our lowest priority, right? So that's our number four substituent. The oxygen is our number one substituent. But then between these two carbons, that's the same thing. So we've got one of them has to be two, one of them has to be three. Um, so what you want to do here is uh, can use I, I I call it the chain rule, where if you have a tie of what's connected to the chiral center you just progressively sort of move out, right? So you want to list all of the elements directly bonded to that first element that you just analyzed and continue going out until you reach a tiebreaker, right? So keep going. The first center that has either a, a higher atomic number substituent or has more uh, substituents, then you assign that a higher priority. So if we try that for here, we have our second center right here, right? So this center is going to be connected to, let's see, a carbon, a hydrogen, a hydrogen, right? This center connected to, what do we got? Yeah. So we've got a fluorine, a hydrogen, a hydrogen. So then which one of these would you uh, would you give priority to? Yeah. So this would be number two, this would be number three, right? So we can go ahead and mark that off. So we have two, three, four, one. Then go ahead and uh, circle around. We've got one, two, three in a clockwise direction, which would be in our center, right? But we have what our H, yeah, our H is a wedge. So we need to flip that R to an S. So that's an S chiral center. Questions there before we, uh, before we move on. And again, we'll have a few more of these at uh, when we get to the problem set section. Okay. Um, so there's a number of models for chirality, right? Um, in general, our brains are really good at manipulating things that are familiar to us. If you were to look at this picture of a dog, right, this front profile, and I asked you, can you describe to me what the side profile looks like? I don't think anyone in this classroom would be struggling with that, right? The issue is in chemistry, we're working with molecules, and molecules aren't familiar objects to us. So we struggle to do that mental manipulation, right? 
So to deal with this, we have several different models to uh, sort of project this, this 3D center as a 2D representation. So the, the one that you guys are familiar with should be the wedge and dash projections, right? We've been doing that for a week or two now. Um, so we're good there. We understand that. The other two are Fisher projections and Newman projections, which, which are going to be new to you. We'll go over Fisher projections uh, for the rest of this section. And then next time we'll, get, we'll bring in Newman projections and sort of round it out. Okay, so Fisher projections, they are probably the simplest way that you can convey stereochemistry in 2D space, right? So Fisher projections are going to look like this sort of crosshair, right, where your, your four substituents are on the outside of the crosshair. Um, the two rules are horizontal bonds are going to be the equivalent of wedges. Uh, vertical bonds are going to be the equivalent of dashes. So a really easy way to uh, keep that straight is horizontal bonds are like coming out and hugging you. They're coming out of the vapor. Um, and this is a really good representation of why Fisher projections look the way that they do. It's essentially we're taking a 3D model uh, and it's it's sort of like if you were to look at the shadow of that tetrahedral carbon on a piece of paper, then that's what Fisher projections are conveying. Okay, so um, you guys can get out the, uh, the practice problems that I gave you in the beginning. Um, go ahead and get into the same groups that we were in last week, and I'll leave up the uh, SIP rules and the steps for Fisher projections, and I'll give you guys the next 15 minutes to, to go through uh, those problems, and I'll be around if you have any questions, so definitely feel free to ask. So yeah, then at this point, they're in their groups. I, I generally randomly assign groups uh, like once every two or three weeks. Um, so they're not stuck with the, the same group the whole time and get sort of like in a groove. Um, I'll give them time to work through it and I'll go group to group. And um, at the end, we'll start to go through some of these problems. Um, and I list them off. So uh, uh, one of the ways that I'll assign groups is I'll just be like, okay, all of the December birthdays, I'll have you guys group up. All the January birthdays, I'll have you guys group up. Um, and while I'm going around talking with the groups and seeing where they're at, um, I'll assign certain problems to certain groups where uh, they'll be responsible at the end of the lecture to uh, sort of walk us through their thought process and um, walk us through how you can solve this problem. 